We're over here arguing about code coverage and somebody gives us a four day old one. Why reaching 100% code coverage must not be your testing goal with examples in C sharp. Okay, obviously, first big mistake is C sharp. Got him. Got him easy. Destroyed. Get wrecked. Um, I, I'm, I'm fully in agreement with this statement, but I'm willing to be wrong. And I do mean that. I am fully willing to be wrong here. All right, table of contents for an article. Come on, just a second. If you're here and you're a software engineer, did you know about storing domain and networking cost? Do this thing in this blog. Uh, something configured ad sense. I'm not really sure. Okay, code coverage is a valuable metric in software development, especially when it comes to testing. It provides insights into how much of your code base is exercised by your test suite. However, we must recognize that code coverage alone should not be the ultimate goal of your strategy. It has some known limitations. Okay, okay, okay. 100% code coverage does not guarantee your code to be bug free. Yes, we all we all know this. You can't you can't test it. You can't just write hard code to test your way out of things. This article will explore why code coverage matters, its limitations, and how to balance uh, achieving high coverage and effective testing. We'll use C Sharp to de demonstrate the code coverage and how you can uh, and how you can cheat the results. Okay, what is code coverage? Code coverage measures the percent of code lines, branches, and st or statements executed during a test. It helps answer questions like how much of my code is tested, are there any untested paths or dead code, which parts of the application need additional test coverage. In C Sharp, tools like Cobertura dot coverage and Visual Studio's built-in coverage analysis provide code coverage reports. You may be tempted to think that higher the coverage, the better the quality of your tests. However, we will soon demonstrate why this assumption is misleading. Okay, 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 okay. Hold on, let's lay, let the man cook, everybody. Why test? It's not expected. Cobertura. You know you got to really lean into that. Oh, I like this. In my opinion, the bottom line is you can't enforce thinking through something with policy gates. I don't think you can force somebody to become a good tester by saying that they need 100% coverage. I think you'll get a bunch of lazy tests that get there. Gatekeeping? Hmm? Okay. Thank you, Brumry. I appreciate that. Testing's for pussies. Say it out loud. Put my foot down now. Um, all right. Clearly, if you write valuable tests, the code coverage is a great ally. A high value of code coverage helps you with risk mitigation. High coverage code reduces the risk of undiscovered defects. If a piece of code isn't covered, it will likely contain bugs. Okay, I don't agree with that statement just in general. I do not think that you can say either or. Because most of the code you write is happy path code. And most of the code you write or in most of the code that's tested is happy path code. And those are the easiest ones to get right. It's all the other parts of it. Uh, code is destined to evolve over time. If you ensure that most of your code coverage is covered by tests, whenever you'll add some more code, you'll discover which parts of the existing system are impacted by your changes. If you update the production code and no test failed, it might be a bad sign. You probably need to cover your code you are modifying with enough tests. I don't know if I actually agree with this statement either. Again, if you update your code and no tests fail, I don't see how that's bad or good. I think more like this. If a piece of code isn't covered, then you can't be sure it doesn't contain a bug. Okay, but then I would give you the opposite ax axiom. If a code is covered, you can't be sure it contains a bug. Like, I, I, don't, I don't think you can, like, that, that's what I'm saying. I think the difficulty here is that there is, these statements, these statements mean nothing. In this sense, like this, this statement means literally nothing. The sky is blue when it's not orange. You're like, yeah, it's, sure. But it's orange sometimes also, you know, when the sun's like setting and stuff, it's kind of get a little orangey. And you're like, well, yeah, but we're talking about the blue. And you're like, okay, cool. What are you saying? I don't get it. 100% code coverage is still useful to find dead code. How? You have covered 100% of your code. How do you know it's dead? Like, like it, isn't it the opposite? Isn't what you're saying the literal opposite? If your test tests 100% of your interface, all of your code should run. No, that's, that's not 100%. Coverage is not coverage of interfaces. It's coverage of code. It's, in fact, the opposite. If you have 100% code coverage, you're certainly not getting a good insight into dead code. All right. Guidance. Uh, let's see. Code coverage ensures that critical parts of your application are tested thoroughly. Also not true. Good tests focus on the functional aspects of code. What? Rather than the technical aspects. How? I'd have to think about that statement more. I'm not really sure I understand it. A good test suite is safety net against regressions. This is fine. I think this is true. This last statement is very, very true. If you have a known bug and you ensure that you put stuff in, it does mean that you will probably not make that bug again. 
right? Now you may make it in a new, in, a, in an extravagant way, but it's unlikely you will create the same oopsie daisy more than once. Again, this goes back to the exact same thing that I've talked about, uh, chat is dumb, where I test the things I don't, like, I don't know I can get correct first try. Like window spec, ensuring that I can create a window, do all the stuff and close a window. I know I could probably add some more tests, some different stuff with the, you know, specification, all this kind of stuff, but I wasn't, I could not do all this once and testing it was extremely difficult. Actually doing, going through the process of testing and untesting required me to close down Vim or clear out the Lua cache, re-bring everything back in, re-execute a script, seeing if the results were correct. Instead, I could just write something that can just tell me those things very, very quick. That just feels easier. This was even harder to get right, right? Doing a caching mechanism, ensuring that from a string, I could actually build out the correct display from a string. I could not get this right first try. This was ex this was an extremely difficult piece of code to get right first try. As you can see, very easy to goof this up, especially with one-based indexing. One-based indexing, the death of all programmers, by the way. Um, I found it to be very difficult to reason about. So this makes perfect sense why you'd want to run over this, right? Like why you'd want to test this because I don't think I could ever get this right in one try at all, ever, for any reason, right? And it's just so much faster to have a function I can run and test it over and over again. So yeah, I'm happy about that. I've covered regressions. Now I won't goof up messing that up. Lua, why one? Why one, Lua? Uh, code coverage highlights areas that need more attention. It, it guides developers in writing additional tests where necessary. Again, I mean, that, that that assumes this axiom is true and that the inverse isn't, right? There's a lot of assumptions made in there. The limitations of code coverage. While code coverage is valuable, it has limitations. False sense of security. Achieving 100% code coverage doesn't guarantee bug-free software. It's possible to have well-covered code that contains uh, subtle defects. This is especially true when mocking dependencies. Oh, boy. Every time you mock... You have just stated that you understand the universe for that mock, and you will be able to represent all of its behaviors properly. Mocking is particularly egregious when, uh, when discovering problems. I can't tell you how many things I have discovered in production or in code where the mock makes a false assumption about production. So not only do you have a test that tests something that no longer exists in production, but it also guards you from getting the actual answer correct. Mocks are literally the devil. <laughs> They're the devil. For what it's worth, we, add about, we added 100% uh, coverage to get our devs to actually write any tests along with their PR. Otherwise, they just wait till it breaks before writing another test. I'm actually not necessarily opposed to that. Uh, surprisingly, easy to keep your coverage over 80%. In short, when someone complains about 100% code coverage thing, we explain that it's a culture thing to try to get devs to be good citizens. So, here, so here's the question I think you need to ask yourself. Why aren't tests right? Why are devs not writing tests? My assumption is that whatever the environment is makes it hard to write tests to test specific things. Because you can't tell me that no devs writing code that's not difficult, that they can't get right in the first try. So if they can have an iteration cycle that's directly better than trying to run the entire program, then there's your problem. I mean, that's another reason why I write tests is because guess what? It is a thousand times easier testing this in a test than it is trying to test it while running it. And so whenever you get into this part where people aren't writing tests, I often think the environment to write tests is more difficult to test and run than the thing itself. Yeah, the, the env is often the problem. In reality, uh, the reality is writing testable code is hard and most devs is new. This is also very, very true. A lot of people don't know how to write testable code. That is a very fair statement. You're using a logical fallacy. So are you. Uh, the existence of bad tests is not an argument against 100% code coverage. Of course, the tests have to be effective as well. When safety is uh, by far the top priority uh, example in software for airplanes or x-ray machines, remember, I, I don't see why you shouldn't have 100% test coverage. I guarantee you, you could have had 100% test coverage and still had that x-ray machine problem. But you're doing like the literal exact opposite problem. 100% code coverage does not mean the software is safe either. Right. And so it's just like my argument is that we should make good tests for things that are very valuable. We should not make tests for the sake of making a test. I don't think x ray machines are simple. I never said that. I would most certainly have never said that. I just don't think that you can make those statements. Right. Therac 25 mentioned, let's go. Yeah, exactly. For those that don't know, there's a couple people that died because of this uh, race condition effectively that happened. While the arm was moving, if you reset a value, the value wasn't accepted despite the UI still showing it. And guess what? 
pretty much guaranteed that a unit test would have definitely thought that that was fine. Let risk determine the testing conditions. When it comes to any of these other things, I would much rather see Tiger style. I'd much rather see tons of asserts, negative space, and a shit ton of simulation testing on these things, right? I would much rather see that because you're gonna because you could use code coverage from your simulation testing, and you could say we are testing 100% of the code with simulation testing, and at least that's way more believable. At least at that point, I'm like, okay, now we actually have real things. What does it mean by testable code? Testable code is really, really simple. Let's pretend I have a function, foo, and inside function foo, by the way, this is uh, Lua, so just deal with it. Inside function foo, I go to the, uh, go to the uh, server for some data, right? And then I uh, do some things to, ah, uh, things to uh, data, right? Right, in here. This is very hard code to test. This is very, very hard code to test. You have to have something that you could override, say, go to the server. You have to dependency inject at like a, at like a, a level, right? You know what's much nicer? Foo, data. This is very easy to test. Because this, on the other hand, I can just make up the different shapes I need that I think are well tested or difficult to produce. And I can test that really simple. It's, I mean, that's really, that's how you write testable code. Right, it's 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 like as simple as that. Test me, Daddy. Okay, anyways, uh, they focus on lines, not behavior. Code coverage doesn't consider the quality of test. It guarantees that the line uh, that the test covers all possible scenarios. It touches all possible lines. Doesn't cover all possible scenarios. Some code paths, execution handling, rare conditions are too complex to cover. High coverage doesn't uh, necessarily mean thorough testing. Facts. Okay, practical reasons why code coverage percentage can be misleading. For the sake of this article, I've created a dummy.net API project with the typical three layers, controller, service, and repository. Uh, it contains a controller with two endpoints. Okay, so we got one endpoint, uni universal weather forecasting controller. Uh, we got a little HP get we get enumerable weather, forecast weather service by locations, to list, weather get my min pl planet, weather min planet, whatever, universal stuff, weather service. Another one of these. I don't really know this pattern. I don't know what I'm looking at. I enumerable weather by locations. Argument out of uh, argument exception throw if less than this. Weird way to throw exceptions, but whatever. Do this. I really hate when people program logic like this into a function. Throw if less than or equal. You know it's like way cooler. Just if location is less than or equal to zero, throw out of range exception. You know how much nicer it is to just have that can we just all agree that this type of stuff is just just why have one more level of indirection why can we just stop can we just stop and then right afterwards doing this mr safety safety pants you toss in a non squirrely brace if statement you're being an evil individual okay you can't do that you can't do that we can't actually that's crazy evil okay this is way more terrifying this is way more terrifying than anything else anyways okay do a bunch of crap, more of this stuff, blah, 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 blah. Okay, fantastic. Finally, the service calls the repository, omitted for brevity, just a bunch of uh, items of in-memory uh, lists. Then I created an end unit test project to generate some uh, unit tests. Okay, let's see what the unit tests are. All right, so we got some setup. We got some teardowns. Ooh, we got some mocks. Oh, you done effed up. You done effed up already. And this class covers two cases, both related to the forecast by location method of service. Case one, the location exists in the repository. This method must return the related information. Okay, this is what we expect. Here's the new clay thing. We do this. We tell it to, hey, you get these functions right here. Do this guy right here. Now we got it. Okay, great. You've tested that your mock is fantastic. Your mock Real nice. Real nice mock there. Case two, the location does not exist uh, in the repository, and the method should throw location not found exception. Do a little bit of this one. Null. Get a little location. Assert catch this. Okay, fantastic. All right. When I run the code coverage report, I see the following results. Line covered 16%. Branches covered 25%. Fantastic. Test coverage 16% of the lines, 25% of branches shown in the chart above. Delving into the details of the weather service class, we can see that we have reached 100% code coverage of forecast by location method. I hope you don't test that anymore. Look at that. You got 100% coverage. We got 100% coverage. You don't need to test that, right? Right? I think everybody can see the bug, right? Can everyone see the bug? Can everyone see the bug? They haven't tested this thing right here. All right? They haven't tested if your argument is out of... Is that, if it's out of range. 
can't see the screen well too bad i don't think i can really zoom in it's an image argument out of exception it's 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 this lineup here it's this one every single time you run by this code of course you run this line now what you don't see is that underneath the hood this function has not covered code so then you end up testing the function to make sure that that function works correctly so you'll notice that you get 100 percent code coverage you have you can test that this thing throws properly, and you test that this function works and gets 100% code coverage. But you actually haven't tested to see if this function throws when you hit there. You actually haven't tested the, the, the most important case of this function, which is the rare event. All right, let's do this. This is fantastic. This is, a good, this is a very good example, by the way. Let's review the code under question, blah, 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 blah. Only tests covered by two cases. Location exists. Location does not exist. However, there are no tests to cover the following question. Uh, the location uh, is less than zero. The location is exactly zero. The repository throws an exception. Right now, that exception is not handled. The location does not exist, but it uh, has no weather forecast info. Or the location does exist, but it has no weather forecast info. Is this a valid result, or should we have thrown another uh, custom exception? So we have 100% code coverage for this method, yet we have plenty of uncovered cases. You can cheat the result by adding pointless tests. Yeah, so this is where the 100% gets so dangerous, is that you create tests to increase the code coverage, but you're not testing the thing, right? So if I tested the exception throw if less than zero, I don't actually test it in my real function. I just test it in this synthetic way. And then I get this really weird Sounds like bad unit testing practices. It actually, no, you know what it sounds like? It sounds like every unit testing practices of all time. It's just what it is, sad padding. It's so dangerous. This is why I don't like 100% code coverage is this exact same reason is that you end up writing, you, it hides to you the real reason what things are not being tested. To demonstrate it, we can create a single uh, test method to reach 100% code coverage with the repository without even knowing what it actually does. <laughs> Totally useless test. Get location by ID, planet Jupiter, uh, equal one, uh, one equals to one. Nice. Nailed it. Here we are. We've reached 53% uh, total code coverage by adding a single test. Does it provide any value? Mm -hmm. Society? Fantastic. You can cheat by excluding pa uh, parts of the code. In C Sharp, there's a handy attribute you can apply to methods and classes exclude from code coverage. While this attribute can be useful for classes you cannot test, it can be uh, it can be used to inflate the code coverage percentage by applying classes and methods you don't want to test. Maybe because you are lazy. Hmm. That's actually pretty funny that you can do that. I don't even. Know. I didn't even actually know. One would argue that it's better than nothing, and I'd say that one argument was shitty. Hmm. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. 100%. We're destroying it, boys. I never said, I know you didn't say that. I, I know you didn't say that, but still, people are getting this idea. That there's people that argue that 100% is good. I, I'd say 100% means nothing. That's what I say. 100% code coverage means nothing. If you say, I have a project with 90% code coverage, 60% code coverage, and 100% code coverage, which one has the best coverage? I would say, I don't know. That's what I would say. I would say, I have literally no clue which one contains the least amount of bugs. I could say the one with 0% probably contains more bugs than one with some percent. 0%, I can at least say the likelihood of bugs is higher. You have even run your happy paths. But everything else, I don't know. I think most stems from management, not devs. Well, there's risk factors too. Like people have talked about like medical equipment. Like what do you do with medical equipment? Do you do 100% test coverage? Pro probably. I, I, I honestly, I think for not getting sued, you probably do that. W what's the correct percent? What's the correct percentage you do on medical equipment or self-driving cars? That's where things get really tricky. And I'm totally on that. I'm totally on that team where it's just like, what's the proper amount? I don't know. The problem is, is that I want good test coverage. Uh, as we saw, high code coverage is not enough. It's a good starting point, but it must not be the final goal. We can, indeed, focus our efforts in different areas. Testing quality, prioritize writing meaningful tests. I, again, this is, is it's meaningless. I mean, for the average product, not talking. let's not talk about the specialty cases. I think the best way, the best way to have a well-running project is to have is to have tests easier to write and run to test your project than to run your project itself. And I think as long as you can always have tests that drive any difficult feature, I think you'll have simply a better, you'll have a better experience. That's the only way I think it could be done.
Focus on edge cases, boundaries, values, uh, all this. Yep, agree with that. Uh, exploratory testing, manual testing, complements, automated testing. Ooh, yes. Exploratory testing uncovers issues that automate tests might miss. I mean, it's true. It's called, that's called production, by the way. Manual testing is called production and canaries, okay? You log and you find out why things change, okay? That's called production. Instead of just measuring coverage, consider a mutation testing. Introduce artificial defects and check to see uh, if the tests catch them. Negative space programming. Uh, finally, my suggestion is to focus on integration tests rather than on unit tests. This testing strategy is called testing diamond. Yeah, that's where... Is it, isn't it testing pyramid? I don't know about the diamond. I'm not sure about this whole diamond business. Anyways, this was actually really good. I like. I mean, I. I mean, I like. I loved the the thing he showed. By the way, this was fantastic. I loved the example. Testing the reverse funnel. I do like integration testing, but there also can be very difficult setting up your project. In integration testing, has to be in the culture and thought of first. It's so hard to go back and try to make integration testing work. I think 100% becomes popular if it lets you have the false sense of security and you don't have to review tests to actually make them meaningful, fairly. Diamond, because you have more integration tests, I guess. Wasn't that like supposed to be like the, t I thought it was always this, right? Is that you have like the tip is unit. And then you have this whole, people give different names and honestly, these names mean different things to different people. You know, you have functional tests. I'm pretty sure most people cannot even tell you the difference between a functional test and an integration test or end-to-end. -end. Where's end-to-end -end in this? Is functional right here and then end-to-end -end, or is integration end-to-end? -end? How do most people feel about it, right? Most, I, I, I think that this whole part of the triangle, most people don't have very good definitions for. And then at the end of the day, Illuminati. Again. 